Ah, it's a tweet. Fabulous. Another tweet. Third and fourth. Hey there, I'm Robert Mugga, and I'm the research director of a think and do tank in Brazil called the Igarapé Institute. I also happen to have a hobby about cities. I'm obsessed with cities, what makes them fragile, what makes them safer, uh, and I'm here to answer any questions you got at Singularity University. What's that I hear? Oh, look at this. Hello, Twitter bird. This is from Jason, Jason Nuanes. What kind of politics dominate the areas with the most gang violence? What are the gun laws like in comparison? Well, that's a really, really interesting question. The challenge with gangs, you know, and you got lots of gangs here in America. You got gangs all over Central America and South America. In fact, you got gangs everywhere. You know that San Diego has more gangs per capita than anywhere else on the planet? That's a fun fact, and I bet you didn't know that. Um, but yes, in many parts of the world where you got really big gang problems, and I'm talking like third generation gangs, like the M13, the Barrio 18, you know, the, the Crips, the Bloods, you tend to see, especially in parts of Latin America, a pretty conservative set of politics, a pretty, you know, what we call mano dura, iron fist or heavy fist type politics when it comes to gangs. And the response has been to crack the hell down on these guys, to essentially introduce draconian penalties, to, uh, you know, essentially increase the rates of incarceration, to throw these guys in jails. And the problem with that is that if you were a pretty low key gang member before you went in jail, when you get thrown into jail in El Salvador or in Honduras or in Brazil or Colombia, you come out like a hardcore gang. We call them crime colleges in Latin America. Where we see successful approaches to dealing with gangs is when you start looking at the underlying factors that shape people's joining a gang in the first place. Often young people join gangs because they don't have alternatives. They can't go to school. They're not easily retained in school. There aren't after school programs. Often they come from broken families where parents aren't able to look after their kids. Often it's a lack of jobs. So when you start thinking about dealing with gangs, not through the lens of law enforcement, police and criminal justice, but through the lens of prevention, development, and rehabilitation, you tend to see really good outcomes. One thing we gotta get serious about are guns. Now, in the United States, you enter a bizarro world when it comes to talking about gun control because really the debate is so polarized uh, and it's so immune to data that you tend to have just an ideological discussion, on it, not one based on facts. But let's talk about a few facts when it comes to guns. If you got a gun in the home, your likelihood of being a victim of it, or your wife, or your child, increases between 4 and 14 times. In states that have pretty easy access to guns and concealed weapons permits, you tend to see a higher rate of homicide. The facts are pretty straightforward, and where we've seen very specific evidence-based gun regulation undertaken, you tend to see a drop in homicidal violence. It's that simple. Look at this, lo and behold, it's a Twitter bird. Uh, this tweet is from Santo Romano. Oh no! As a <laughs> midpoint in 2016, can we agree, agree to end the war on drugs in 2017 and start the war on poverty? Santo, you are a dream tweeter. This is exactly the kind of question I like to answer. The first thing I'd say about ending the war on drugs is that it's absolutely the case that we got to start getting smarter about drug policy globally. Uh, we got to move away from a paradigm of prohibition to one of regulation. Um, you know, I think we're going to look back, not just in 2017, but in 20, 2018, 2020, 2025, and go, what are we thinking about this war on drugs, this disastrous policy that we've had? It's the most ass-backwards, non-evidence-based, non-data-driven set of initiatives that we've ever had. There are some really excellent examples of where we've actually already moved towards ending the war on drugs. You don't have to go much further than four states here in the United States that have already essentially legalized recreational marijuana. 26, 27 states have already liberalized access to medical marijuana. And even in some states, they've done a full-on decriminalization of all drugs. Take the case of Portugal. Portugal decriminalized not just marijuana, but heroin, cocaine, amphetamines. And people thought it was going to turn into a narco state. They thought that tourists were going to come all over the world and just you know, use drugs. They thought crime was going to go up through the roof. They thought HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis and, 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 and diseases associated with injection would you know, skyrocket. What happened in Portugal after you know, 15, 20 years of their experiment? Well, crime went down. Drug consumption went down. 
You know, the, the exchange of needles went down. The prison population went down. And it was all done through a really sensible set of policies, you know, basically taking drug users out of the criminal justice system and putting them in the public health system, creating courts and alternative justice systems for guys to, and girls who are using drugs to get access to treatment and care and rehabilitation, not being chucked into jail, you know. And, and it was a, an educated, informed, honest debate that really, really changed and transformed the, the trajectory they were on. Where we got a lot of work to do is in Africa and Asia right now, where it's still it's pretty authoritarian in terms of responses to drugs. Uh, so if we can start taking some of the, ex the excellent models that we see in the Americas and Western Europe and looking to, to export them to places in, in Africa and Asia and adapt them appropriately, we might be able to get rid of this war on drugs by 2017. It might take a little bit longer, but, but let's use 2017 as our marker. All right, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, it's been a delight. For another episode, check it out. If you want to subscribe, check right down here. And as always, if you want to tweet, it's right over here. If you want to see some really nifty data visualization tools, uh, I really strongly recommend you check out our visualization that tracks the global arms trade. We'll get right back to you if you tweet us uh, and send us your messages. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much.